Pastor Nicole shares with us from the book of James. I'm Pastor Jason Barnett, and this is the Dirt Pastor Mc Podcast. Open to James chapter 3. And while you're doing that, ooh, that was a hot mic. <laughs> while you're doing that, I'm going to go ahead and share a story about my first car. Um, so when I got my driver's license, I was, a, I was one of those late drivers. I turned 18, I got my driver's license, and my dad handed me the keys to his 1987 S150 old beat up logging pickup truck. <laughs> it was so beat up that that, that it's, um, the truck bed had rusted off. Like, my dad pulled out of the driveway and the thing basically fell off the truck. So he decided to go ahead and have the flatbed put on. And that thing was just hideous, it was a total jumper. I loved it. That was my car. Everybody in my family, um, up till me, learned to drive on that car. Um, my my oldest brother, it was it was brand new when he was driving it around. But then my my sister, she had it uh, while she was in high school, and um, there was one time where she had slammed it in the park hard enough and. Uh, and they ended up rolling backwards and hitting the, hitting the uh, superintendent's car <laughs> in the parking lot. <laughs> the steering column was loose. That truck was just beat up. It was a mess. But I had liked that car. It was my baby, and I babied it. It didn't matter that, you know, the, the entire side was rusted. It didn't matter that the um, seats were all ripped and faded. I took care of that thing. I vacuumed it. I washed it every week, at least once a week. Can't say the same thing about cars, but, but that was my baby. I loved it. And I drove it for about eight months. And then one day, my oldest brother comes home. He's totaled his car. And he can't borrow his friend's car because he totaled it. And so he, he asked my dad, he convinces my dad to hand over the key to the car that I had been driving because he needs to get to work. And the thing with my brother is at the time, he was a, a really bad, like very addicted to drugs. Very, very addicted to drugs and alcohol. Um, and I knew, based on his driving record and what had been happening recently, that if he took the key to that truck, I was never going to get to drive it again. And I was right. The very next day, he calls my mom from jail, and he says, Mom, I totaled the truck. He'd been intoxicated and he drove it into the side of a bridge. The entire thing was gone, and that legacy of that truck ended that day. And it ended because the wrong person was driving it. Instead of somebody who was going to take care of it, somebody with selfish ambitions and their own agenda got behind the wheel of that truck and it's gone. But how many of us are like that truck? For the record, that truck's name is Old Blue. How many of us are like Old Blue? How many of us are being driven by the wrong driver? Instead of, instead of, instead of holiness and the pursuit of holiness driving us, we're driven by our own agendas, our own selfish ambition. How many of us are driven 
by bitterness and chaos. And then we're shocked when our lives end up crumbling. What drives us? What drives you? That's the question we're going to be asking today. So, James chapter 3, starting in verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness born of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be boastful and false to the truth. Such wisdom does not come from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, and, and devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Okay, anyone who's familiar with the book of James knows that it is a letter of action. It's, also, it's known as the Proverbs of the New Testament. It is, it is where faith meets what you do. James, throughout his entire letter, is encouraging his readers to not only believe and listen to the word of God, he's asking them to do it. You know, we, we say, you know, the Lord says, but how does that affect our daily walk? How does that affect our lives? But the thing is, is without, sorry, the brain just got ahead of me. <laughs> he's, he's saying, do what God's word says, because the fact of the matter is, is that without works, um, backing up our faith, it's dead. He says in his letter, faith without works is dead. Um, I, I just took a class in, in the book of James, and um, and one of the one of the uh, teachers was saying that it's not only dead, it's non-existent. That thing never existed. See that that's kind of a powerful depiction. Um, but but so we know that faith without works is dead. But what do the work? Where do the works come from? Verse 13 says, Who is wise and understanding among you? Show by your good faith or your good life that your works are done with gentleness, born of wisdom. So good works are done with or are born from what? Wisdom. wisdom. So who is wise and understanding among you? It's almost like James has transitioned from the action, from speaking on faith to speaking on wisdom. And let's be honest, everybody here would like to believe ourselves wise, right? I mean, we're wise, right? Everyone, everyone reading James' letter in his original audience, I'm sure they were all thinking, hey, I, I'm wise, I'm pretty intelligent, you know, I, I've read the Proverbs, I know what wisdom is. But James, wanting to make sure everything is clear, he actually shares a litmus test for those who possess wisdom. Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness, born of wisdom. In other words, if you're going to claim to be wise, your actions better back that up. But then James, typical James, he flips the script. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be boastful and false to the truth. 
It's so easy to be in, to claim to be in possession of godly wisdom, right? So easy. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your heart. The thing with the, the Hebrew here, I, I did a, or Greek here, I, I did a word study, and it does, it could be bitter envy, and it could be bitterness and envy. How many of us are holding on to bitterness today? How many of us have looked at our neighbor and said, oh, they have a they have a better car than me? Or their yard's so much better kept up than mine. Or you know, their house is bigger. I, I want their house. You know, I, I want I want the, what they have. How many of us, when we make our decisions, our decisions are based on what is good for me? If you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be boastful and false to the truth. In other words, if you have those things in your heart, what you're claiming is godly wisdom, Paint. But why? Why can why cannot what can we not claim to possess godly wisdom if we have those things in our hearts? What is it about wisdom from God? Actually, no, scratch that. What is it about God's character that makes feeling these things incompatible with his wisdom? But when it comes to bitter envy and wisdom and selfishness, James makes it clear that such wisdom does not come from above, but is earthly, is unspiritual, and is devilish. Three things that God is not. In fact, James points out another flaw in this heart state when he says, for where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. God doesn't. So why can't we hold on to bitterness, jealousy, and selfishness? Because the resulting consequences produce a fruit that is not of God. And like Jesus says in Matthew 7, 17, and 18, a good tree cannot produce bad fruit, and neither can a bad tree produce good fruit. By their fruit, you will recognize them. By your fruit, we will recognize your wisdom. A heart full of bitterness will not produce, or a heart full of bitterness will produce bitterness. It won't produce godly fruit. So, if holding grudges and being self focused isn't from above, then what is? But wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. Wisdom from above is first pure. E.C.S. E e Gibson said it perfectly. First pure, meaning for at any cost, even the cost of being peaceable. A Christian must first be true. Pure. I'm not talking about the evangelical true love weights movement of the 1990s. I'm talking about unfiltered truth. Pure. Pure truth directly from God. It is first pure. It is peaceable. Meaning that if there is no truth to confront, it strives for peace. I'm a ginger. I 
love a good debate. There's some times where <laughs> I just want to debate people John does. <laughs> I love a good debate. And debates are great. Not speaking out against debates, but sometimes the desire to debate, the desire to challenge myself intellectually or theologically or whatever, it comes at the cost of being peaceable. But it is first pure, then peaceful, gentle. You know, truth can be shared in a gentle way. Even when we know that somebody is going completely the wrong direction, we can still be gentle. We can still share the truth and be gentle. It's too easy to say, well, they're wrong and dehumanize them, so we don't have to be gentle, and we can just be as horrible as we want to be. But it is gentle. Godly wisdom is gentle. <clears throat> it's willing to yield. Oh, this one's hard. Nobody wants to yield. Right? Nobody wants to say, hey, you know, yeah, I was wrong there. You were right. But see, that's the thing. Being willing to yield. The original term, according to John MacArthur, is described as someone who was teachable and compliant, easily persuaded, who will willingly submit to military discipline or moral and legal standards. But for believers, it defines obedience to God's standards. That means that willing to yield means that when we are faced with biblical truth, instead of fighting it and getting defensive and being like, no, this is not okay because I don't like it, we're saying, okay, the Bible just proved me wrong. But how many of us are willing to admit when the Bible proves us wrong? No, we want to get defensive and say, well, someone's so teaching wrong. Doesn't matter if they share scripture directly. It's willing to yield. Godly wisdom yields to the truth. Full of mercy. Are we full of mercy? Honestly? When somebody does something wrong to us, are we full of mercy for them? Are we forgiving and extending forgiveness before they ask for it? That's mercy. It bears good fruit. Godly wisdom bears good fruit. And when we think good fruit, we think the fruit of the Spirit. But, and and, and it's, that's it. That's, what, that's the wisdom. That's the fruit that wisdom produces. But there's another aspect here. I want to, I want to point it out. The, the Greek for good fruits can also translate to praises. It produces praises. And, and not necessarily just from us. The people watching us live out this godly wisdom can only look to God because they're saying this is not humanly possible. They are not doing, they're not living like a normal human being. They're, this, this wisdom can only come from God. Their behavior can only come from God. And therefore, praise God. Godly wisdom produces the 
praise, produces praises from the people we are among. Are our lives pointing people to Jesus and causing him, them to glorify him? Godly wisdom is without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. That means just what it says. We're not going to be partial to a certain demographic, whether it be political, racial, theological. It loves everyone. There's impartiality. Because you know what? We demand to be loved and respected. We know that God loves us and, and died for us, right? We say that we love God and want to love others the way that he loves us, right? But if we're being partial to specific groups, we're being hypocrites. We're being old hypocrites. And I'll tell you, it doesn't produce the praises. That kind of attitude doesn't produce praises. The thing is, if we're wanting to possess godly wisdom, we have to stop living with bitterness, prejudice, pride. We need to stop telling everybody God's message of forgiveness if we're going to refuse to forgive, or if we're refusing to forgive. We need to stop preaching about the selfless sacrifice of Christ if we're going to be selfishly motivated. If we're to produce fruit that results in others praising God because of how we live, we must learn to live without partiality or hypocrisy. And I'll tell you, It'll produce a harvest. There are plenty more room, plenty more seats in this sanctuary for people. But I'll tell you, unless we're producing the fruit of wisdom, they're never going to be filled. Unless we are living out the wisdom that only God gives, they're never going to be filled. When God's people truly pursue godly wisdom, one of those pure, peaceable, gentle, teachable, bearing a good fruit, and without hypocrisy or partiality, it will produce a harvest. And that's not to say that it will be an easy road. Any farmer will tell you, as I'm sure most of you already know, the process of growing a crop is not easy. There's a lot of work involved in reaping a bountiful harvest. The same goes for spiritual harvest. <clears throat> There will be weeding out of bad ideas, bad theology, <clears throat> bad behaviors. There will be difficult truths that need to be shared to fertilize the soil. And yeah, sometimes they feel like poop. There will be watering both the gentle fellowship of Jesus as well as when the storms come and all you can cling to is Jesus. 
but the time of harvest will come. And there's going to be times when we don't see the fruit. Where we don't see people praising God because of us. But the harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who made peace. So I want to ask you again. What is it that drives you? The book of James shares a lot about the works of a person and how the works of a person back up their faith. But from what we've seen today, there is a whole other element here. Works confirm the faith, but wisdom motivates the work. If we're motivated by greed, Regardless of the level of our faith, our actions will respond to that goal in mind. You realize that prosperity gospel preachers regularly use this tactic. They feed off of the greed of their congregants by saying, hey, if you write a check for $1,000, God will bless you with tenfold. And so they're thinking as they write that $1,000 check, $10,000 in the bank, right? Or something like that. Something to that effect. And the people, yeah, they're acting in faith. They truly believe that God will bless them. But their wisdom isn't from God. Their wisdom is based on greed. Which is earthly. Unspiritual. And devilish. Wisdom motivates the action. Wisdom reveals your driving ambition. So what ambition drives you? What wisdom drives you? Are you driven by bitterness? Do you make decisions based on the fact that you just don't like that person? Are you holding on to jealous feelings because somebody has a better car? Or a better job position? A better house? Are you motivated by getting that promotion at work? And, and getting that pay raise? Or is your ambition to be a peacemaker? To be gentle? And to bear good fruit. Today, the question we were asking was, "What drives you?" That isn't something I can answer. Only you can. But if you looked at yourself and realized that life all blue, something was driving you that was earthly, unspiritual, and devilish, I invite you to leave it at the feet of Jesus. We are called to be a holy people. As Nazarene, we believe the doctrine of entire sanctification, and if we're holding on to something that is not from above, we must leave it here at the altar. If we are going to be sanctified and set apart, let us be sanctified and set apart entirely, holding nothing back. If we're holding it back, we need to leave it here. Are we holding anything back? Are you holding anything back? Leave it here. Because that is the only way that you will experience godly wisdom and that you will live out godly wisdom. If you are holding on to something that is not from above, it is earthly, unspiritual, and devilish. Leave it here. We need to 
to adopt a life of heavenly wisdom, of godly wisdom. A wisdom that motivates us to act within God's desire. To love his people the way he calls us to love them. To love sacrificially. Let's leave with a new ambition, a new driver. One of godly wisdom. Let's be peacemakers instead of drama seekers. Let's be gentle instead of blatantly abrasive. Let's be teachable instead of defensive. Let's be full of mercy and good fruit, and let us without harsh, let's be without partiality and hypocrisy. Let the wisdom we have, we possess be pure. Let it be from God. This message was recorded live at the Greensburg Church of the Nazarene, located at 31 Bluebird Lane in Greensburg, Kentucky. Uh, to learn more about us or to let us know that you were listening, visit www.gbergnaz.com. Special thanks to Buzzsprout for hosting this week's episode. If you want more from the Dirt Path, please like our Facebook page.